So today I'm going to talk about, the, um, about investigating the flow dynamics of ice shells, and in particular the flow dynamics of ice shells at the carving front. So this is work undertaken as part of my PhD under the supervision of Richard Hindmarsh and Gray Worcester. So as an initial motivation, um, sea level rise is an ever-increasing threat to many low-lying countries throughout the world. Um, the, mass sheets of, the ice sheets of um, Greenland and Antarctica are, contrib are, are contributing factors to this. And between, between 1992 and 2011, the, the ice sheets of Antarctica and Greenland lost approximately 11 millimetres, uh, which is equivalent to sea level rise. Uh, this mass loss from Antarctica is mainly driven by the flow of ice off the continent into the ice shelves, where it is ultimately lost by submarine melting and iceberg carving. So these ice, ice shelves act to buttress the glass, glaciers and ice streams that flow into them, and, the, and in, in response can uh, reduce the discharge rate. From the, from the grounded ice. Um, and this is seen in the collapse of the Larsen B ice shell, where um, after the collapse, the glaciers and ice shelves flowing into the former shelf uh, sped up. So there are many factors which may determine this, the extent of this purchasing. And the one I shall focus on today is the extent of the ice shelf and the, uh, the carbon front flow dynamics. So in 2008, Ali et al. proposed an empirically derived carving law, which said that the carving rate C was proportional to the width of the, width of the shelf, uh, W, uh, multiplied by the um, strain rate, epsilon, and the shelf thickness, H. So these, these quantities were all measured at the carving front, or, or near the carving front, and, were, and the data was taken from shelves with uh, station, or stationary or near stationary carving front positions and the, the, the data used in the, in the paper can be seen up here. However, in 2012, Heimarsh argued that this um, relationship was in fact due to the viscous supply of ice to the carving front um, and could, could uh, show that this, there was a relationship of this nature using a scaling analysis. So the scaling analysis had three components. Um, the first is the continuity equation with the effects of uh, melting neglected. Second is the boundary condition at the carving front where the extensional stresses at the carving front balance the hydrostatic pressure of the ocean. And the third component is the force balance equation for a laterally confined ice shelf. So here all quantities with subscripts to C denote quantities measured along the center line of the ice shelf. They're both the continuity equation and the boundary condition equation are fairly straightforward. However, the force balance equation stems from uh, considering the force balance equation for an ice shelf flowing in the uh, x direction only, um, where transverse shear is, uh, proportional to, is linearly proportional to transverse position. So using this scaling analysis and taking n to, be, to equal 3, uh, we see that the, there should be a scale, uh, proportionality that we can see down here, where the uh, velocity of the carving front is proportional to the width multiplied by epsilon h to the 3 quarters. So despite there being a disagreement between these two um, between these two uh, uh, scaling relationships, uh, we can see that both relationships require knowledge of the uh, strain rate at the carving front. So in a bid to do this, we use the Renew et al. ice surface velocity. Here we use the updated version, where velocity measurements are given on a 400 meter grid resolution. Um, so to this data, we apply a Gaussian low pass filter with a standard deviation of um, four grid cells, or 1.8 kilometers. So this, this is, the purpose of this is to smooth um, sharp variations between satellite swath uh, boundaries. So from this, we can calculate a strain rate. So here we say we define the strain rate as the strain rate at each point aligned with the flow. So this is given in vector notation up here as the, as the unit vector dotted with the strain rate tensor dotted with the unit vector. So for the for Amy I shelf, we can see two plots in the bottom left. First is the speed, and we can see that as the, as the ice flows over the grounding line, we have a, a high point in speed. However, the ice then slows down as the channel becomes, or the ice shelf becomes wider. Um, there's then an acceleration in the final third of the shelf, where, and, a, and then a finally a peak in velocity at the carving front at the center. In the lower plot, we see the, um, the strain rate. Um, in the grounded ice streams that, con uh, that flow into the ice shelf, we see red, red positive strain rate. However, there's a transition to negative strain rate in the, first, in the upstream section of the ice shelf. Then there's a, as we move towards the carving front, we then see positive strain and the maximum positive strain achieved in the final third of the shelf. 
And then on the right hand side we can see similar plots for the get size shelf. Um, here again there's a peak in velocity at the, um, at the carving front at the centre. This time the strain rate is mainly positive uh, with some negative areas upstream and behind this island or ice rise. So we then construct a series of streamlines which, which, which trace the path taken by ice as it flows towards the carving front. Um, along these we can sample stra um, speed, strain rate and shelf thickness. So then here the thickness data is taken from the bedmap 2 data set. Um, so we use the, the streamline of maximum velocity uh, as this theoretically should provide values along the center line of the ice shelf. So here we can see in the, the lower plots uh, the strain rate and streamlines for Filchner and, get, and Getz ice shelves. So to, to calculate a, a mean strain rate or a, to calculate a strain rate we take uh, the, the, the strain rate values along this, along this uh, streamline of maximum velocity and, um, and then calculate a mean over the final 20 kilometers. So here the carving front is at the right hand end of the plots and the ice is flowing from left to right. And so whilst doing this we collect, so we collect, this, collect the mean strain rate in this manner and then collect the uh, speed and thickness at the carving front. So this process is repeated for 22 Antarctic ice shelves. So we can now plot, plot all the data for the, all the 22 ice shelves. Uh, and here we have uh, velocity divided by width against strain rate multiplied by thickness in log-log space. So we hypothesize that there should be a linear relationship between these two, between these two factors. Um, and if we draw a line by eye through the, ma the majority of the data, we see that there's a, there are a number of outliers that's, which should lie to one side of the data, all to the, to the, the up, up side of the, the line. Uh, so, the, so these these ice shelves have, have, uh, have a higher velocity than we, we, would, we would expect to see. And these include Pineland Glacier Ice Shelf, uh, Robert Glacier Ice Shelf, uh, Fimble Ice Shelf down here, and Dolman here. So in the scaling analysis of, of Hindmarsh, we saw that there were two assumptions made. The first was that the shelves were actually confined. And this, mean, this means that they're, both, they're only allowed to flow in the long channel direction. And also that there's, there was a resistance provided from the sidewalls. We also assumed that there was a constant um, a rheology comparable between the, the center of the shelf and the margins. So if we look at each ice shelf in turn, we see that some, some ice shelves don't conform to this, this assumption. So looking first at the Fimble ice shelf, we see that there's a nice, a nice tongue has begun to form. So now this, this section of the shelf at the carving front is allowed to spread both in the along flow and transverse flow directions. So moving on, we see for, for Pineland and Glacier, we see there's a a large transverse gradient in velocity, velocity between the grounded, the grounded sections where there's near, near stationary flow, to flow in the ice shelf where there's flow of over three kilometers a year. So this, this margin shows that there's, there must be high values of shear in this margin. The rheology may be very different from the rheology in the center of the shelf where there's near uniform flow. And we can see that in the modus imagery here um, that there's lots of there appears to be lots of damage and crevassing and fracturing in the, in the margins, so therefore we'd, we'd, we'd imagine that the rheology would be very different from that at the center. So using, using this, this analysis, we can uh, remove ice shells from the data set that uh, don't conform to these two assumptions. So in doing that, we can plot the, the, new, the new data set here. So at the top, again, we have a plot in log-log space uh, with the blue crosses indicating the excluded ice shells. So this is, so then doing a, a non-linear, uh, sorry, a linear regression in log-log space, we can see that the, the line here has a slope of 0.74 um, with, the, with the variance, or which explains 82% of the variance in the data. These two red curves here indicate the 95% confidence interval. And then again, we can do this, repeat the same procedure, but now using a non-linear regression. So now we're using just the, the in, in, in the normal space. Again, the blue cross is showing, um, showing the excluded points. This time we get um, a fit with proportionality to, to epsilon h to the 0.75. So now, and this explains 85% of the data. So this is very close to the to the scaling the scaling analysis we proposed earlier. However, you can see that there are a lot of scatter in the data, and this may be due to the fact that. There is this differing rheology between the margins and the, and the center of the shelf, and also we've neglected the effects of melting, so that might 
co co make a contribution to the, to the scatter. So to conclude, um, we aim to build on and clarify the work of Aliatel and Highmarsh, investigating the flow dynamics at the carbon front. We've demonstrated a method to determine the strain rate near the carbon front, and in doing so, produced strain rate maps, um, strain rate maps for a number of uh, 22 ice shelves. Um, and we could we could use these potentially to investigate features on the on the ice shelves, such as frac fracturing crevasses and features in the shear margins. So this data set has been compiled for 22. Antarctic ice shelves, and from the data we, we, we can see a, linear, uh, a relationship of this form where the, the velocity at the carbon front is proportional to the width multiplied by epsilon h to the three quarters. So any vari variation in the data could be explained um, by the rheology or uh, the, the melting that's not accounted for, and we also know that the, this relationship breaks down for ice shelves that are not laterally confined as, this, as, as well, when they're not actually confined, they're able to spread in both the transverse and the long flow directions, and there's no resistance provided by the sidewalls. So on that, thank you very much. Uh, we've got time for questions for Martin. Yeah, so I mean, uh, from the. Can we get back to yeah, so if, if, if I put a, li a linear fit into, into the, um, the top plot. Sorry, yeah. <laughs> so if I put a linear fit in here. So, yeah, that's what you're saying. How would it compare with the data? Yeah, there's, 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 it, was, it, was, it would not lie within the 95% confidence interval. Yeah. Okay. How do you choose which point to exclude? So, using the, the, um, this analysis. So, any, any, any shelves that protruded um, past any confining points, such as these ones here. So, once you start to form. Um, an ice tongue, then shells were excluded. Or if from looking at MODIS data, you could see that there was large amounts of fracturing and crevassing in the margins, or any, you know, yeah, then those, those points were uh, removed as well. <coughs>